I'm Harvey Smith. I'm a co-creative director at Arcane Studios. Uh, I was co-creative director of Dishonored 1, and I was creative director of Dishonored 2, and I'm probably best known for the Deus Ex and Dishonored games. All right. Uh, people still talk to you about Deus Ex a lot? A lot, yeah. It seems like every few years it has an anniversary or whatever where we all get <laughs> interviewed, Warren Spector and uh, the other people involved. So Yeah, Warren's doing a, a post-mortem uh, yeah. this year, actually, in fact. I, I got to see Warren recently. I guess we were in Spain. We were in Bilbao. Mm. And uh, it's funny how the years give you perspective on things. I mean, it's obvious, but like, you know, the things we thought the day that we signed the game off versus a year later versus 10 years later, right. those things change over time. You see it more clearly, maybe, or you see it through nostalgia. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but it's, it'll be interesting to hear his, his postmortem. Right. So when you do look back to that game, like what are the things that stick out to you, whether it be the design or the, the time and place in your life or like what was... Deus Ex one for you and like the, the, the Harvey Smith story as it were? I probably can't give you the answer that you'd like to have because it's so wrapped up in my personal understanding of myself mm. and I'm a very different person today than I was then. I had a lot of perspective to gain on creative work and team chemistry and interpersonal relations and mm. things like that. I think part of it is a tinge with regret for how hard I was to work with. Right. Um, <laughs> And it was a different time in my life. Like my ex-wife was a school teacher, so she literally had to be at school at some insane hour, like right. seven, to prepare for the students. So we only had one car. She dropped me off at like 6.30. Right. The team didn't really get in until 10. So I would literally have like three hours working alone in this empty building as a level designer before everybody else rolled in. Mm -hmm. And then I would switch gears and be like, you know, uh, leading the level design team or working with the systems guys or working on the fiction or whatever, alternating between those three tasks, talking to Warren. But when I think about the game, when I think about that time so long ago, I think about how many talented people we had working on it. The mm. team size was probably 20 or 30. My goodness. Uh, which seemed, you know, fine for the time, right? We had three programmers, I think, three or four, if you can, a contractor. Mm. Um, and Doug Church would come by every now and then, our old mentor, and like uh, just play the game and comment and talk about, help us f refine our goals, what we're actually trying to accomplish creatively. Uh, but there was a lot of tension, a lot of conflict on the team, and I kind of mm. regret that because I know now some of those same people working with him, I'd probably have a, a smashing time, you know? Right. It's funny, I see the Austin office of Ion Storm as like two phases for me because I was there six years, but three years on one game, three years on the other. Mm. And I would say one was more fulfilling in terms of accolades by far, you know, Deus Ex 1, of course. But the other one, in terms of interpersonal relationships and how much I grew and how much I learned about myself mm. and creatively how, you know, I uh, got to stretch some, some muscles, uh, build some muscles that, uh, that I'd been working on. The second one was very satisfying, but it was also turbulent in a, in a completely different way. I went through a divorce, mm. you know, we grew the team size drastically, we were working on two games at once, which is a huge challenge. What was uh, the other game you were working on? Well, the other side of the studio was uh, my friends Lulu Lemaire and uh, Christine Coco and Randy Smith, certainly. Mm. Uh, they were working on Thief 3. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's interesting to look at Deus Ex 1 and 2 back to back and say, you know, why is the second one not as popular as the first one? Mm. And there are a lot of technical reasons you could point to, uh, changes in personnel and, and title and role. You could talk about writing our own engine versus using Unreal. Mm. You could talk about the publisher asking us to make the game not just for PC, but also for console at the same time and how we had not done that before. You could talk about us feeling this weird pressure not to repeat ourselves. Right. Uh, because I just went through this experience with Dishonored 1 and 2, back-to-back mm. -back working with Rafael Colantonio and Arcane. And when I felt that twinge, like, you know, don't just repeat yourself, I was like, wait a second, there is a pattern here in this game that the players of this game love, mm. and they want to see again. They, they want it as familiar as possible and as fresh as possible yeah. at, the, at the same time. Right? It's that old uh, Raymond Lowy, the designer from the 50s uh, concept, so it really served me well, uh, having worked on Deus Ex 1 and 2 when it came time to do Dishonored mm. 1 and 2. The fact is, every time you make a game, it's a big undertaking by a team of people. 
It's incredibly complicated. You can't predict uh, how it's going to turn out. There are so many factors and so many influences that you could take the same group of people and the same tech base maybe and try 10 times to make the same type of game and each time it's going to come out a little differently. Yeah. Now under very controlled circumstances it might be better and better and, and maybe you know some teams are capable of that but uh, in our case there was so much change uh, that it was harder to predict uh, from project to project what mm. was going to work and what wasn't going to work. Um, so yeah, it's it's just um, it's very easy to point to things that are your your pet theory or whatever you know. Yeah. But in reality, these games are are really complicated, and uh, there's so many minds involved and so many hands involved that it's uh, it's volatile each time. But there were many things I did like about it, and I occasionally I do every year. I talk to people that didn't play the first game but only played the second one, or they were only Xbox or PS2 uh, players, so they encountered that and it blew their minds because it was kind of an immersive sim and unlike anything that was out on the console at the time. And so I, I like things like uh, Sheldon Picote's, uh he worked toward the end of Dishonored 1 with us, the second half, and had to do a mad scramble to pull all our stuff together into a coherent script. He did a great job. But he had all this time on the second one, right? So yeah, I like, I like, some, I like the fiction, you know, uh, J.C. Denton coming back into the world. Uh, the two coffee shops at war with each other in the end they're being owned by the same uh, corporation or whatever there there are many things i like about it you know? yeah. so like you were saying at the beginning if if you just took invisible war as a standalone game like um it wasn't associated with the deus ex series i think it would have been perceived differently because uh expectation is a huge thing especially once someone invests in something and they're a fan of it then it it follows a certain pattern that they want to see repeated and there's nothing wrong with that familiarity is very strong let's talk a little bit about um world building the opening level of the first deus ex was set in uh, a very contemporary icon of america that most people can sort of empathize with right yeah and then the second game was sort of pushed that little bit further into the future and was sort of a little bit less relatable right um with the Dishonored franchise, you've you've done it in a completely fantastical universe, but there's a lot of flavors and notes in there that actually are very easy for people to connect with right. in this sort of contemporary world. Um, can you talk a little bit about that sort of process? Uh, yeah, so the first Dishonored game is an analog to Edinburgh or London, mm. uh, and it speaks to the, the power of our art team to be able to take those elements uh, but also our narrative team, to take those elements and make them familiar and yet tweak them a little bit so it feels like a fantastical place. And the second Dishonored game feels much more like Southern Europe, you know, places in Spain or Italy. The art team had a very strong vision for the second game and so narrative like complemented that. But they work hand in hand the entire time mm -hmm. in, on both games and in different ways. And so uh, there is something to be said for like making something familiar so that people feel grounded uh, and, you know, you alluded to Deus Ex. Um, we built the first game around New York initially and then had moments of Paris, for instance. Mm. But the fact that it was, like, right around the corner science fiction, I think, was one of the very strong things about it. And then for the second game, we tried to go, I don't remember how many years it was. Mm. This is one of those Jeopardy questions in my <laughs> retirement year uh, that I'll be asked, I guess. But, like, uh, you know almost unrecognizable in, in, in some ways. I mean, like, you could extrapolate, but it, it's not, it doesn't feel like you're exploring uh, a city. And, and, and I think at the time, we even saw that as a criticism of, of Deus Ex 1. We were like, oh, right. it just kind of looks like New York from the 70s or whatever, you know, and built by a bunch of people that hadn't been to New York. Right. You know, like, Warren obviously grew up there. Mm. And I think went to film school there. But, like, working hand-in-hand -hand with him, he, you know, he was talking about different locations, Battery Park. Well, we, I had never been to Battery Park, right? And a guy named Bob White built that map in particular. But I built the Statue of Liberty, and I've still never been there. There was this <laughs> moment where I was working on it, and I couldn't get the base right. Because back then, you did not only the level design, meaning the gameplay and the flow, but also you did the architecture. We weren't right. specialized enough yet to have really good architects working on it, like we do now with the Dishonored games. And I couldn't get the base, this, this rim piece on the base to line up. And I realized that my two references for different sides of it <clears throat> were photos from wildly different periods, and the the base of it was changed at some point, like yeah. uh, buttressed. Uh, originally, it was just on this like big grassy hill kind of yeah. thing, and 
And I was like, oh, no wonder, you know. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, there is something to, to be said for like, again, I think Raymond Lowy is, you know, the, the theme of the day, but it's like uh, the, the most familiar you can get away with, with while also making something feel uh, different and worth exploring new. Dishonored to me feels like a game that is, it's quite, has very European sensibilities. Do you think that there is a difference in, in like working with two different teams from such different parts of the world that sort of have different uh, touchstones when it comes to building worlds? Yeah, I mean, I, as in games, I've worked 23 years now and I worked in Texas, I've worked in California, I've worked in France and Lyon. And I definitely think cultures put an influence, uh, have an influence over the way the game feels, whether they intend to or not. Mm -hmm. You know, Deus Ex was made by a team in Texas with references to New York and Paris and places like that. But I worked on Fireteam, which was like one of the first games with voice, and we did it in San Mateo. Mm. And it was definitely like um, kind of a Silicon Valley tech culture influence over that game, I think. You know, like the innovation was there. Like, we, hey, we made a game with headsets and voice before right. anybody had done that. Uh, we were looking at matchmaking and teams, and uh, but there was also kind of an MIT influence over that because mm -hmm. it was a spin-off of Looking Glass. Dishonored 1 um, was made by a team in Austin, Texas, and a team in Lyon working very tightly in ways that uh, would be hard for anyone else to reproduce. Uh, we started the project, Rafael Colantonio and I, in Austin with a small prototype team, and then at some point we rolled more and more people from Lyon onto it, and then by the end of the project, the bulk of the production was done in, in France. Mm. Uh, but it was very much like this the entire way, video conferencing and traveling and people moving back and forth. Um, and so, I don't know. I, I mean, it's like once a team gets to 100 people, obviously you're talking about a lot of people influencing the direction of the game. But at, at its core, there are a number of people trying to steer the ship mm. and... Uh, the, the culture of those people, the personality, the histories of those people, they all definitely influence what the, what the game is about, you know, and how it feels. You know, we wanted to make a game that felt like you were uh, a single agent set upon by hostile forces and you had to either outsmart them or overpower them or get good enough at the game to avoid them. There's that tension, right, like of avoiding attention because too many guards can overwhelm you. And mm. even fighting five guards in Dishonored is, is difficult. But we also, it's a power fantasy about mobility and about being able to stop time. And, you know, there, there, it, it's multiple things to multiple people. Like there are people that play the game and they ghost their way through the game. They right. feel the power fantasy that they have is that no one even knew I was there. Mm. And the other people that just like destroy everything, they, they, the power fantasy there is I left the town burning at my back. Um, so it was that whole gameplay pattern uh, and servicing those types of players. Uh, then there was the art aspirations. Mm. We wanted to create something very beautiful but not photorealistic. Uh, all the plague and death and oppression in, the, in those games. And then there are probably t personal touches here and there from uh, me and Raphael besides the systems we're interested in and the, and the mobility and the, the fighting and the stealth and... Uh, jumping from rooftop to rooftop aside from all that stuff there's a there's a lot of mother trauma in mm. in the dishonored games uh and familial connection in both deus ex and dishonored I right think. and for some of us it's a source of power mm. uh other people would rather leave that out of the game or whatever but right uh and then we also wanted a, a narrative layer that uh told stories just through visuals you know you like look around and get a sense of the place and who lived there and what happened uh, you know, it's a game about uh, corrupt aristocrats right. working very hard to create a two-lane society, one for the gilded uh, few of their friends and everybody else sort of crushed underfoot with no, no rights, no middle class. Uh, the guards can knock your teeth out and collect money from you just because you looked at them wrong. Mm. And um, it's a bit of a fantasy. Instead of us all pulling together and working legally to counter that sort of thing, it's a bit of a fantasy that if you just knife the right five people, <laughs> right. Uh, the world goes back to, to, to normal. But, but that's part of the purpose of media, right, is, I guess, to, to let you countenance those things and to give you a, a way to blow off steam. At the end of the day, the creative directors, or in the case of me and Raphael working together, the, the two of you, the, the little collective that that makes the game, 
your personal tastes and desires matter. They, they influence the game in, in ways that are not rational. They're not the friendliest to the tech. They're not the friendliest to the production or the schedule. And so in many cases, we just we pitched an idea. We prototyped the idea. We let people on the team change the idea. We play tested, and then we changed based on play test. But in a few cases, we stuck to something from the beginning to the end um, that probably didn't make sense. Uh, and, and sometimes you hang on to those things for too long and then you realize you're going to have to kill them. We killed a power of Emily's called Void House pretty late in the game. And it, uh, it was a cool idea, but it just didn't fit in the end. And uh, we probably should have cut it earlier. Mm. But uh, having Corvo or Emily as playable characters is something I'm very happy that we did mm. because Erica Luttrell and Steven Russell did such an amazing job of emoting as those characters. And players really responded to one or the other of them. And it gave players more choice on top of that. It's familiarity and nostalgia for people who love the first game. Starting in Dunwall and going to Karnaka and then mm. going back to Dunwall is another thing like that. Where I feel like most teams, that's the first thing they would have excised because it's a lot of extra objects. Mm. We literally have different furniture, different uh, tech devices uh, in Dunwall versus Karnaka. We wanted the two cities to feel very different. We wanted you to feel like you were leaving home, going to an exotic place and coming back home. Mm. But uh, yeah, those are, those are things that were important to me and to other people on the team. So we stuck to them even though they were hard. At the end of Dishonored 1, uh, I knew I wanted to work on Dishonored 2. I was very excited about it. Uh, but it made the most sense for the team in Lyon mm -hmm. to do that project. And so I moved there and it ended up being four years that I, that I lived in France. It's an amazing place, amazing people, amazing food, architecture and history. Mm -hmm. But I moved back to Austin and I've been playtesting Prey for a couple of months and uh, uh, giving feedback to Raf and Ricardo and the, the team there in Austin. Uh, Prey is one of the best games I've ever played. Uh, and it's, uh, it's another alt world that's beautiful. It's like, what if Kennedy had lived and the Russians and the Americans had worked together? Mm. Uh, what if the Russians and the Americans worked together? <laughs> imagine um, that. Imagine that. I can't imagine yeah. a world in which that's the case. As much as the United States is challenging right now, right. and there are th there are undercurrents that uh, I think most people weren't aware that, that they were as dark or deep as mm. they actually are. It's, it's threatening. It's, it's uh, concerning. It's not just the United States. It's right. the UK. It's France. And France. Now. I it's mean, like you, a, you, a couple yeah, there's, ahead. there's kind of a rising tide of, mm. uh, you know, uh, nationalism, I guess, mm. or something. So what, you know. Uh, a lot of the things that we've put in Deus Ex and Dishonored, you know, but right. uh, so it's, uh, it feels like I came back to a changed America or uh, an America that is, has a different awareness about itself. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting time to come back to the United States for sure. Yeah. GDC is odd for me. And I guess a lot of people would, would feel this way because uh, I haven't been coming for the last few years. Mm. It's just been too hard to get over here. We we're working on the project. I had some life stuff going on. And now I'm back and it's, uh, it's so fascinating because I hear people saying things like, this talk was great, that talk was great. Uh, I hear other friends saying, oh my God, I was so under pressure to give this talk and then I got good responses to it um, or I learned some things. I hear other people saying, oh, my favorite part of GDC was having dinner that night where across the table we had this design discussion about this problem this other friend is having and we all gave our opinions on, mm -hmm. on it. It's just like so much enthusiasm, so much passion for that stuff. And I feel like GDC has this arc where it's super overwhelming and exciting initially uh, for all those reasons. Mm. And then you sort of become good at it. You find the, the talks that you want to attend uh, and you make those conversations happen more. But then it like you get to some point where you're like, I have those conversations at work every day. I sit next to <laughs> Seth Shane and like... We started talking about, um, during the course of the day, we probably had three talks, each 15 minutes, rapidly going back and forth on like skill trees and whether you should assign a lot of points to the first level so that the successive levels are cheaper and encourages specialization, or should you assign uh, higher point values to the high end of the powers, but then people end up with a wide range of skills and going deep on nothing. And we just like rant and, and rave about those types of subjects. Mm based on what he's working on with Prey or what we just did, Dinga and I and the other guys on, uh, on Dishonored 2. And I feel like 
that's like a micro talk or whatever, you know, right. and it, so I get here and I'm more like, I want to see old friends. Mm -hmm. I want to just reconnect with some people. I like, I like seeing the new faces. Uh, it's a more diverse crowd now and I'm mm -hmm. really happy about that. Um, but honestly, I find some of it exhausting now, you know, <laughs> to, be tr to be fair. Well, we won't keep you any longer in that case. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm.